Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Fantasy Fangirls Podcast, where two sisters dive deep into beloved lore characters, themes, theories, and more. Thank you so much for joining us today, where we are covering chapters 52 through 56 of Iron Flame by Rebecca Yaros. But before we begin this deep dive, please listen closely, as always, to our content warning. Most importantly, we share spoilers for all of Iron Flame, so we may be focusing on chapters 52 through 56 today, but we are bringing the whole book into the conversation. That means everything from Iron Flame, Fourth Wing, and anything else that Rebecca Yaros has said, it's all on the table. So if you don't know why, chapter 56 is my favorite of all time for very smug reasons. Then please go finish the book. When you come back all finished and whatnot, we will still be here talking about this chapter for hours. Next, this podcast is rated R. We, a fantasy fangirls, are adults who say adult things with adult words about an adult book. Fire, death, destruction, betrayal. That's just a taste of some of the things we will be talking about today. It's not our normal sex and smut, but still some pretty adult topics, y'all. Last thing before we jump into our Iron Flame episode 10. If you love fantasy fangirls and you want to support us in making this dream our livelihood, if you want more content, more community connection, discounts on merch, early access to episodes, and more, please check out our Patreon. We have two membership tiers, Cadets and Dragon Riders. The link is in the show notes or YouTube captions, depending how you're listening. And really and truly, thank you so much for helping us bring these episodes to you. It means the world to us. And now it is time to learn about Zayden's second signet. Huzzah! 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 So excited. <laughs> so excited. Now, before we dive into all of that juicy stuff, let's begin this episode deep dive, as always, with Nicole's battle brief, aka her summary of what happens in chapters 52 through 56 of Iron Flame. Chapter 52. At Rhiannon's sister's house in Erasia, all of our second squad is huddled together, and yes, that includes our newly absorbed flyers. Violet announces to them that she knows how to raise the wards. Oh my god, but it comes at a cost. Griffin flyers won't be able able to channel. That's the cost. That's the cost, friends, but she's still all up in her morals about it. Plus, the Griffin Flyers are being little bitches about it, considering the opposite means safety, not only for them, but for any poor million refugees, too. It's like we have opinions about this. But our girl Violet says, look, I'm going to give you a choice. No matter what, the Assembly will know, and we will have wards. Bye! I'm at least going to give you some non-magic advantages, like explosive arrows that Sloane recognizes as Mayor Sight. In another nightmare, Violet is suspended with a purple-robed Venon toying with her. She's so used to these dreams by now that she knows exactly what to expect. But then the Venon does something new and quite literally terrifying. He grabs her by the neck and homeboy spins bit some scary prophecy-esque words at her. You will turn. You will both turn, but it will be for love. Oh, and one of their kind thinks that she's just never going to yield to them and they should just kill her. Then he snaps her neck and good morning, Violet. That's how she wakes up. Violet bolts up in bed, shaking off her fear and then snuggles up to Zayden, listening to Taryn chastise her for not waking herself up like an adult. I'm an adult and I can't even do that. So fuck off, Taryn. Six days later, Fourth Wing is geared up for a mission. There are runes hidden in the caves alongside Erasia, and in groups of four, they're going to go and find said runes. Seems super simple, right? Nothing bad could ever happen in something like this. But just as she's about to fly out, Violet sees Zayden and Garrick rats him out, saying that he took down a Venon outside of Drathus. That's really fucking close to Erasia, by the way. And Violet's face rats her out. Zayden figures out she knows how to raise the wards. And he's like, hell yes, let's do it. Like a normal fucking person. But Violet says, no, no, because she's got a training mission to go to. Because that's definitely more important than setting up the wards. Chapter 53, on their hike to the cave, where Tara believes that one of these runes is hiding, our four ladies start to chat, and Sloane is really starting to warm up to us. Finally reaching the cave, but packed snow closed them in, this group fumbles for a light, since none of them are good at producing mage lights. Violet, brilliant fucking woman, strikes again. She hands the conduit to Sloane and stretches her lightning, creating an energy line from her to the conduit. Pretty cool stuff! Cat lights the torch in this energy path and has a rare moment of honesty, showing her jealousy of Violet's power and control. These four ladies continue their walk in the cave, and Vicia finally asking the question that's literally driving an entire fandom wild, she says, do you think you're going to get a second signet? But the mic drops don't stop. Sloane drops the knowledge bomb that if you bond a dragon in your direct familial line, you will get a second signet or go mad. What the fuck? 
what? Violet freaks out, but there's a disturbance in the cave. Right as they find the rune they've been searching for, Solus walks out and raises some hell, killing Vicia instantly. Chapter 54, Solus is unhinged. No surprise there. Violet taking Cat, she pulls her behind her, saving her life. But in Darna to the rescue, she wraps Violet, Sloan, and Cat in her wings and protects them all from becoming quispy. Violet, in her stress, crushes the conduit against her hand, and like the brilliant fucking woman she is, she sinks the alloy into Solus's flesh, and she starts to wield into the conduit, and thus Solus. But her brilliance only lasts so long. Solus whips her to the side. For Injuring Violet and Sloane drags Violet out of the cave. But Sloane is freaking out saying she's turning venom because she's draining Violet's power. Nope. She is as Neolin was. A siphon. Yay Sloane for manifesting a signet! Then Indarna exits the cave blood dripping from her mouth and her poison barbed tail. And then Taryn gets a new nickname to add to his list for other people. Slayer. Later in their room in Erasia, Zayden bursts through the door to see Cat. What the fuck are you doing here? She wanted to ensure that Violet got to a healer safe in exchange for Violet saving Cat's life in the cave. With a thank you, Sorengale, she leaves. But the drama doesn't stop there. Here we go, friends. Zayden is pissed that Violet chose to save Cat over herself, yelling at Violet, saying that all he wants is her safe. And Violet, chuckling that off, says that she gets the line of him, you know, wanting her safe and wanting to kill her, a little confused sometimes. But boy, oh boy, was that not the right thing to say because Zayden comes in with the knife twist. Are you finally ready to ask about the deal I made with your mother? Chapter 55. Oh, this is bad. These two have the fight to end all fights. Violet is pissed at Zayden that he doesn't tell her things. Zayden is pissed because she doesn't ask the question that he knows she wants the answers to. Finally, addressing that he knows she is scared to ask said questions because she doesn't trust herself to handle the information. And that wasn't the right thing to say because a seething Violet finally puts the theory to the test. And y'all, it's freaking tough. Because she asks him, what's your second signet? Zayden, shocked to the core, has to answer the fucking doorbell and the tension keeps building because Tyrandor is under attack. It's time to raise the wards. Chapter 56, my favorite chapter in this entire book. Dane, Reed, the Assembly, and Violet all head to the wardstone and Zayden and Violet are noticeably not speaking to each other. But there's no time to waste. Using the six dragons, all representing one of the dens, they breathe fire onto the wardstone. There's a pulse but it's different. However, there's a non-mistakable hum. They have wards. However, there's no time to celebrate. They have to fly out and face the venom, at least to make sure the wards work, right? A few hours later, Violet and Taryn, followed shortly by Zayden and Sigale, arrive at the edge of the wards, ready for the venom battle to come. But Zayden notes how there's no one around for miles, and it's safe for them to talk. Violet, getting incredibly frustrated that Zayden is not telling her his signet, starts to use her scribe brain and figure it out. And Zayden begs her to stop guessing. And he tells her that if she does find out, she will fall out of love with him and he would be dead if anyone knew. But Violet, persistent, keeps going and after guessing a myriad of signets, which yes, we will be talking about, goes silent. There's only one signet riders are killed for. Zayden Ryerson is and intrinsic and Nicole goes wild. Violet, completely spiraling, notices how Taryn turns to Sigale, betrayal coaxing his emotions. Even he didn't know, but Violet's love isn't fickle. But there's no time to talk. The Venon and the Wyvern are approaching and Zayden better live because she's ready to ask him all the fucking questions. The Venon arrive, all 17 of them and a horde of wyvern and it's looking like it's about to be the end for our dream team here but as the venon sage oh shit this is the one from resin sends the wyvern in one at a time the wyvern cross the wards and sag like the puppets in shrek after their song is done the wards work huzzah pissy little sage venon shoots them a look that suggests he feels victimized by regina george and retreats with the rest of the wyvern and the venon later returning to erasia we learn that it was a staged attack on all fronts but we all also learn that Melgrin has sent a message requesting an audience with Mira, Violet, and no more than two marked ones tomorrow. But that's not all. Serena holds a dagger in her palm and then, using lesser magic, makes it rise in the air. Wow. Cool trick, Serena. Lesser magic. Wait, you shouldn't be able to wield. It looks like Violet's wards. They don't fully work. 
fuck oh man oh man do we all love your battle briefs nicole i find myself doing my reenactments even out on walks when i'm listening to the podcast because yes i listen to my own podcast which by the way now that it's not minus 10 degrees outside i'm so excited to get out for my daily walks again and really kick this new year off right but another thing i'm focused on for this year especially now that our faces are all over the internet and we actually have a photo shoot coming up too which is so exciting it's having clearer healthier skin that's why we're so excited to partner with apostrophe whether Whether you're dealing with hormonal acne, breakouts, signs of aging, or acne scarring, Apostrophe's mission is to empower you and help you feel confident and comfortable in your own skin. Apostrophe is an online platform that connects you with an expert dermatology team to get customized acne treatment for your unique skin. Simply fill out an online consultation about your skin goals, your medical history, then snap a few selfies and a dermatology provider will create a customized treatment plan just for you. Apostrophe offers access to prescription treatments for all types of acne from hormonal acne to facial acne and even back chest and butt acne you know I wish I had apostrophe in my 20s because wow my personalized treatment really does make a difference for my skin and it was so easy to get this prescription that actually addresses my personal skin issues I break out when I'm stressed or when the weather changes or I eat too much rich food or really any tiny little thing can just cause my skin to break out like I'm a teenager again but it hasn't lately and it's so cool our families have even noticed they're making comments about how great our skin is lately I know my skin is clear and oh my gosh, Nicole, when I saw you last week, your skin was literally glowing. And it was it was just like, we know exactly why. <laughs> I felt good in my skin last week. Let me tell you. We have a special discount for our audience. Get your first visit for only $5 at apostrophe.com slash FF when you use our code FF. That's a savings of $15. This code is only available to our listeners. To get started, just go to apostrophe.com slash FF and click get started and use our code FF to sign up and you'll get your first visit for only $5. Thank you so much, Apostrophe, for sponsoring this episode. It is officially time to don our signet power and tap into key insights, reflections, foreshadowing, and all of our favorites, theories. Actually, today it's more proving that Nicole was right with a theory rather yeah, than new is. theories, but you know what? That's all good. <laughs> you made fun of me for my italics bullshit during fourth wing, and now I, I get to sit back and revel in it. No, and I will explain myself in this episode. <laughs> oh, I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> So we open the stretch of chapters at Ree's family's home, which is considered neutral territory for the squad's writers and flyers. Remember that chapter 51 ended on a cliffhanger and we had questions about why Violet doesn't know if they should raise the wards. Obviously, it's because the flyers won't be able to wield and being a good person, Violet doesn't want to strip them of their power. But I am absolutely 100% sticking to my belief that there is a war going on and everyone living in the wards protection is way more important than the flyers being able to wield. Sorry, not sorry, flyers. I love you but come on you you gotta work with it you gotta work with everybody here I like most of them and I really do think that if I was in this world I might not be a dragon rider but I would absolutely be a griffin flyer I forgot about your allegiances that's right it's the Hufflepuff in me it's like I'm good I don't need to be Gryffindor I'm gonna go with my griffin and go have fun with my lesser magic and Violet does ultimately know the importance of raising the wards based on lines like her refusal to believe all of this rebuilding work on Arisha could go up in flames if the dark wielders test the wyvern at altitude I understand understand how the flyers aka primarily cat are upset but again they know what they're up against isn't it better to not have to fight at all with no powers versus fight with powers and risk every single person's life i also want to note that the flyers have lived without wards for years and they've resented navarre for having them and hoarding them i feel like they would all agree that survival is far more important than wielding, maybe unless you're Kat, but I think that's even just her personal vendetta against Violet, speaking way louder than her, you know, logic here. Also, Draethus is a poor million city, and if they get the wards up, they would be able to take in refugees and save thousands of Draethus lives. And also reminder that Draethus is one of the largest poor million cities. Also, Tarn of all people, is behind this. He's like, yes, I think you're doing a very smart thing, Violet, and asking them about their opinion, and da-da-da-da-da. Of all people, I mean, of all dragons, I guess, but of all people in this story, I feel like he would be the one who was reasonable and be like, um, no, save the fucking continent, my girl. Come on. See, I read that as him saying you're doing the right thing, as in raising the wards. 
oh, I read it as you're doing the right thing as running it by the cadets of a fucking college before you that, tell the leader. That was how I read more. it, yeah. I, <laughs> like, I love Violet, but man, her morals just really got to me on this part right here. <laughs> but then we have Imogen, who thankfully states raising the wards was a goal long before the flyers arrived. She is absolutely 100% defending. Yes, we need wards here, everybody. I will say in defense of the flyers, let's look at how the writers really rely on their dragon bonds and powers from their reactions to the serum stripping of the magic in part one. So of course it does make sense that the flyers are similarly reliant on their powers. They naturally feel useless and weak without them and no one wants to feel that way when there is a literal war going on. It is a tough position to be in and it makes me wonder if they'll ultimately have to figure out a way to have fully working wards that include the griffin flyers magic too. How is this going to work at the very end of this book when there are wards versus not wards? Well, I had that same question. At the end of book two, we got the wards back up in Bezgaeth, but the Griffin Flyers are there, or at least the ones that chose to go to fight. So are they going to stay in Navarre as new allies? Are they going to stay at Bezgaeth and like continue their training? But how do they continue their training without their connection to their Griffins? Are they going to go back to Eurasia and continue training there? I don't know. I have a lot of questions about this because I also don't think Kat and I hope not, Mirren, are done in our story by any means. Like, I feel like they would stay. That's a good question, because my guess is that they would go back to Arisha, where the half-wards enable them to use their power, or at least however long the half-wards do last. We know that these are essentially temporary wards here. But I don't see them staying at Bezgaeth. I don't see Bezgaeth necessarily allowing them to stay. They're already having to make a deal with the riders staying. I don't. I can't remember if that included the flyers or not. But I would imagine the flyers don't want to stay. If memory serves, and I could be wrong, I don't think riders are mentioned because it's just like Melgren wants us to stay yep. at the yep. end, and Zayden's like, "So we stay." Yeah, which. We'll discuss at length when we get to that part of the book. (laughs) Regarding the war translation, it's interesting to note that Violet wishes she had someone else to review her and Dane's translation. She calls him rule-following Dane, which why would following the rules be a bad thing in this scenario? I'm curious. I cannot believe I am saying this. However... I agree with Dane and his incessant rule following morals here because not only is it good for just like, you know, following the rules and like this is the right person to tell and da 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 da. This is good for the greater mission as a whole, which was the brain cell that Dane did not have last year in Fourth Wing, that whole greater mission thing. He was just looking at the there and now. So so you're saying that rule following Dane, the rule following is that she needs to tell the assembly and everyone immediately to raise up the wards. Yes, because that was what she was told to do. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to, if that is indeed the rule following that we are talking about here for Dane, I absolutely agree that. What do you think the rule following is? I don't know. That's why I was like, wait, I don't understand. That, that was so. what my assumption was. The rule following is to not go to your squad, a group of like 15 <laughs> cadets. It's to instead go to the people who are fucking in charge of keeping everyone in this goddamn place alive, including this whole other part of a nation now with poor Emil and also they're the people who would be able to take in refuge I cannot stress the importance (laughs) enough of the refugees like that's because she asked Zayden like would you take in people and keep them safe beyond the wards and Zayden did not even blink an eye he said of course we would they are on Draethus's fucking doorstep Draethus is massive city in poor Emil they would take in all of those refugees that would come she would be saving thousands of lives. I'm furious with But Violet. Nicole, cat can't wield. I can't. I'm so <laughs> and we poke fun at Violet here too. And, and ultimately she knows that it is important to raise yes. the wards. And it's more of doing her due diligence to give the flyers a choice of, you know, you can leave or you can stay knowing that the wards are going to be up. It's true. We should note she's no matter what going to tell the assembly because no matter what she's going to tell Zayden, that's just the trickle of events there. But the fact that it's not the first thing she does is what's unforgivable to me. Exactly. She waits until it's literally the Ven and R heading to them and it's like, okay, everybody, go, 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 go. We got to get the words up. And you know, this reminds me of that phrase. I can't remember it exactly, but it's like, your emergency does not equal my emergency or your procrastination does not equal my emergency. And... You know, as a contractor, I get that a lot where where my client will come to me and be like, oh, my God, I need this done right, 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 right now. And it's like, I asked you about this like three weeks ago. Why? Oh, my gosh. And this is exactly what it feels like with the words. (laughs) Yes. 
Yes, I could not agree more. And I'm not going to lie. Violet right now is the coworker you do not want to have at work. <laughs> All right, last thing from this scene here. I love how Sloane recognizes Maysite, which is in a very explosive kind of ore. To help the flyers, they are going to imbue them for the arrowheads so the flyers can use these explosive arrows. It certainly doesn't replace the powers that they have on their own by any means, but hey, it is something to give them the extra oomph or rather the extra boom. Well, and also it's important to remember that in the final battle of Fourth Wing, there was something explosive in Resin that had the Mari family crest on it. And as far as we know here, that was what Violet was referring to when she notes that she's seen this stuff not imbued and it's blown sky high. I'm assuming by this that this is a Mari made, distributed, imbued, whatever, mayor site. And that's why Sloan recognizes it. Mayor site is the family biz, which is pretty dope. I love it. I love it so much. All right. Now moving on to the third and final Venom nightmare that we get from Violet's point of view. We certainly do get one slash memory from Zayden's point of view at the very end of the book. But here it's our last one with Violet. So let's dive on in. We've talked a lot about these nightmares in previous episodes. So we're just going to pull out key information from this specific dream. You make it sound like I'm going to make this short, Lexi, but I'm not. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not. So first and foremost, she mentions that she's yet again in this sunburn field. I looked into fourth wing and I couldn't see anything about a sunburned field. There was no use of the word sunburned or anything similar in fourth wing. But in Iron Flame, the flight field where they have their flying lessons and Dane showed exactly how to do like that rolling dismount with Kath perfectly as Kaori described. That scene has a description of, quote, he hits the sunburned grass at a run. So I wonder if the sunburned field is Bezgaeth, which in that case, would that be foreshadowing for the Venon fight at the end of this book? Or would that be foreshadowing for a future fight that's going to happen at Bezgaeth again? I don't think we're done fighting at Bezgaeth, but I could be wrong. Another thing I wanted to point out is we get notes that this Venon is in purple robes. Now, Every Violet dream that we see on the page, his robes are described as being purple. Although she does say something right at the top of this dream where she says, quote, his robes are purple tonight. So even though his dreams are always purple in the ones that we see with Violet, that does kind of insinuate that maybe, you know, in other dreams that we just don't read on the page, his robes are not purple. And in Zayden's dream slash memory, like, like Lexi said, the general's robes are blue. So whether that means blue equals general and purple means sage, or if it's just kind of like you wear whatever you're feeling that day in the Vannon land, we don't know. Now in Resin, there are both blue and purple robes in that battle. So I'm not really sure what the ranking is there. I'm sure we're going to get more information in a future book about that. Now, there was also a note that the Venon says that Violet is basically a weapon worth watching. She's worth retrieving. You know, it's no s- small hint that they're wanting to quite literally cap or Violet, and as we can imagine, Zayden as well. Now, there was a weapon that killed off the Venom in the Great War. A lot of people, and I'm going to throw myself in there as well, suspect that Violet could be said weapon as, quote, the person who commanded the sky. However, if that is the case, why would they want to retrieve her if she is the weapon that killed off the Venom in the Great War? Why wouldn't they want to retrieve her? That's my question to you. But I thought they they want the weapon that would kill them off and both to kill her or turn her as a weapon against the other side. Okay, that right there makes sense. Because it seems to me like they're wanting her for their side because they keep on saying like, you're going to turn, you're going to turn, you're going to turn for love, like all that. Okay, that makes sense to me. That makes sense. Now there's another moment and I have no answers to this, but I just want to bring it out because it like made my ears perk up. Quote, the one who watched thinks you'll never yield. We should kill you before you grow into your full abilities. Now I'm assuming full abilities means not only as an energy wielder, but also whatever the her second signet is going to be because I'm sure these Venon have some idea of what it's going to be but the one who watched watched what who watched when did they watch because I would have assumed that the one who watched would be the Venon in Resin because they saw her abilities on display there however like this is the one in Resin who is saying this so unless he is talking about himself in third person which I don't really feel is the case huh <laughs> that would be such an evil villain thing to do <laughs> talking in third person I agree I don't think it's him so if that's the case my my assumption would be the general that Zayden fights at the very end because he seems to have some kind of investment in Violet I, I don't know because he also said that Zayden's gonna turn 
for love. Because it like all the other venoms we encounter in this book, she kills. I mean, the venom in Corden, he's dead. Yep. And also he was an asum, I'm assuming. Probably not an initiate, but. Oh, I think he was a sage. Are you sure? Because doesn't he say something about like, I'll bring you to my sage? Or am I getting him confused with another No, one? he says, he doesn't say that Violet clarifies, oh, like bringing me to your sage. And he's like, which one? So he does not say to my sage. He just says to the one or, or something to, to the big head honcho, which we can okay. assume is the general. And therefore, I think that he was a sage because he also had purple robes, which I really am going to stick to my guns with purple robes equal sage. So maybe that's us going back through to fourth wing and rereading that to pull out who has blue robes, because maybe the general is like undercover there while the sage is kind of acting as the leader there. So I have no idea. I need to reread that before I say a officially say that on record even though that this is recording right now <laughs> so anyway we'll we'll have to put a plug in that and Rebecca has stated multiple times that book three we are going to get so much more information regarding the venom so if you are confused about who is who and what is what with the venom it's okay that's how it's supposed to be yeah, we are supposed all, we are supposed to be. to be confused about this and all we can do is speculate and have fun with it yes now we get a huge moment and huge hints on I'm going to say who this sage could be quote he drags a single long fingernail down my throat exposing an expanse of tan arm under his robes and I twitch fear accelerating my heartbeat not only is this the first time he touches her which is terrifying but we also get some insight tan arm so I did a search for the word tan and anyone who was connected to having tan skin the first came up was Dane actually his skin is described as tan in the healer's office in fourth wing now I don't remember if this is tan because he was like doing a lot of flying at that time or if his skin is just naturally tanned hawk nose also has lightly tan skin I have full confidence that the sage has nothing to do with hawk nose Ulysses because also the sage is described in an earlier dream as quote eerily youthful and then also Zayden's skin is tawny which can also be considered as tan so I don't know if this is like a wink wink hint hint this also might mean someone else who has tawny skin or someone else who has tan skin we don't know we don't know but I did find Dane to be kind of a surprising <laughs> surprising addition there <laughs> then we also have something sweet on his breath this obviously stands out to me for multiple reasons and I'm going to go through this kind of quick because I have mentioned this before on the podcast number one like I have mentioned Zayden is constantly being connected to the word sweet whether that's Violet describing him as such or you know like she did with Imogen earlier on in the books when talking about his letters or when Zayden says I am not sweet do not mistake me for soft or kind so Zayden and sweet are constantly being connected however number two we've been clocking the fetid breath the bad breath of dragons and we've been wondering if something is going on with their breath being bad and them being connected to dark magic it is now just so canon in my head and I like have to stop and remind myself that this is kind of a crack theory <laughs> like I do have to remind myself that this is not canon in the slightest but it would be interesting here, the venom being described as sweet, basically the opposite of this bad, fetid, dank huff of steam breath. The word sweet, I don't think is an accident. I think that's very purposeful. What does that mean? I don't know, because we also get the very first line of this fucking book is revolution tastes oddly sweet. I think that word and this word are so, so, so connected. And I don't know what the tie in is yet, but I'm sure it's something we just haven't learned yet. We need to talk about this prophecy that the sage is just throwing down because he says that Violet and Zayden will both turn venom because of their love for one another one already has like by the end of this book and I cannot believe I never thought about this but what if Violet turns or at least is tempted to turn because of her love of, for Zayden. I just never really thought about Violet actually turning as like a possibility. That's so Romeo and Juliet. I know, right? <laughs> and I just, I don't see that being Violet. Like I don't see her doing that. But I don't know, maybe if Zayden's in a bad enough position, I don't know. But I also have a feeling there is something venonified connected to Violet's hair. Now, whether oh, yeah. that means Lilith, we've assumed that, you know, Lilith gets stabbed with a poison blade when she was pregnant with Violet. And that's why, you know, the magic was draining out of Lilith and thus through Violet as well. Hence the hair and all that kind of stuff. And that's almost like Violet's scar. Now, there are some people who think the same thing. However, it means that Violet turned venon as a result in the womb. I don't really know how that magic would work, 
given the fact that it's a poison blade, but I don't know. Like there are some things that say like Violet could be connected to Venom, whether she is one or if she's just like on the same magical playing field as them. I'm going to address that more in next episode because I do have a theory around it. And there's also the theory that Lilith was actually had turned Venom and that while she was pregnant with Violet and that is why Violet is considered part Venom too. There are so many theories when it comes to Violet's hair. We haven't had a chance really to bring it up quite yet. So like Nicole said, we will definitely address that and speculate in further episodes but I do feel like if Violet is in some way Venon the sage here wouldn't be saying you'll turn for love so I feel like he would be saying like you'll turn more or something like that like he would not know if she was Venon because I don't know it feels like a likes call a like calls to like situation I I cannot believe I never even contemplated that Violet could turn Venon like that just never even like like I heard this prophecy so many times and I was like yeah she won't of course not but then I was like what if she does Taryn would be so mad at her <laughs> all I can think about <laughs> I don't see it happening I don't see it happening but Rebecca's I, I would have said the same thing about Satan last book so who knows <laughs> to me the craziest part about this sequence isn't necessarily the nightmare itself but what happens immediately after Violet wakes up Zayden is right there in bed with her this is a record scratch moment that may be another sign of Violet's second signet and we're going to walk through the timeline here in a second but until I did this deep dive reading I actually did not think of this as a record scratch moment and I chalked it up to well yeah he came home and then left again and that's what happens in this fast paced book but then I read the part where she and and Zayden reunite a week later. And I realize that this is indeed very, very sus, and we have to break it down beat by beat right here, right now. So first, let's back up. In the opening of this chapter 52, Violet states that Zayden hasn't been home. He's currently still away. There's no timestamp about when he will be home or how long he's been gone on this mission, but we know that he is away. Then after Violet wakes up from this nightmare, Zayden is sleeping right next to her. He pulls her clothes and she lays her head on his chest, thinking to herself that his heartbeat is one of the most comfortable comforting rhythms in the whole wide world. So cute. Okay, this all checks out, right? Sounds like Zayden returned off page and that's that. Wait! Later in this chapter, it is six days later and Zayden returns with a full riot of 10 and Violet has clearly not seen him recently. How do we know this? Violet notes that his scruff on his jaw is thick with days of growth and there are circles under his eyes. Okay, He's a badass who could have grown a beard in six days. Seems like something Zayden could do. So we'll keep an eye on that, but let's keep going. Here's the big thing. Violet also has not had an opportunity to tell Zayden about how to raise the warts. The way their exchange goes, it seems pretty obvious they have not seen each other since she learned about the warts. It's the first thing she says to him, that she needs to tell him something, and he immediately figures it out. I don't know if it's an intrinsic moment or he just knows her really well moment, but it could be either. The point is that they have not seen each other to talk about the warts. So with this knowledge, how can we explain them sharing a bed six days ago when they supposedly haven't seen each other since she figured out how to raise the wards more than a week ago? So let's walk through some possibilities here. Number one, Zayden came home very, very briefly six days ago, slipped into bed, and then was gone again before she woke up. So he indeed is present in bed, but it was sleepy time, so they didn't really have a chance to talk. This is kind of what I'm leaning toward, though that's a pretty confusing thing to add right in the middle of a chapter, right before they're reunited, like they haven't seen each other in more than one week. Number two, gotta say this, could it be an editing oversight? Unfortunately, there's always a small possibility, but I'm going to choose to believe that it is something else. And number three, everybody, this is a sign of Violet's second signet. Specifically, a few possibilities include, this is one of the biggest supporting points that Violet is indeed a distance wielder. She wasn't actually in their Arisha bed, but wherever Zayden was. I do want to point out that when Violet is guessing signets later on in chapter 56, she guesses distance wielding. And he says, don't you think if I was one, I would have spent every night in your bed. So if that is the case, that would be a classic Rebecca Yaros thing to do that little tie-in right after she literally distance wielded to spend the night with him in his bed. Or her second signet is whatever she needs in the moment. Violet needed Zayden, so he somehow appeared, whether in the flesh or even like a hallucination, that could be her emotional support. Not unlike Liam of obviously not coming from the dead, but like whatever she needed in that moment, which was Zayden's emotional support there. This could also be a hint 
to time manipulation being her second signet, where this timeline, it doesn't make sense for a very good reason. I'm not going to even begin speculating on what that could be, but you get the idea. Time manipulation, this timeline doesn't add up, could be her second signet. Here's the one thing that's making me lean towards it not being a second signet. She has a conversation with Taryn, literally while she's snuggling up with Zayden, where he's like, be an adult and wake yourself up from your own damn dream, like a grumpy curmudgeon that he is. Don't you think that if a second signet manifested, especially if it is distance wielding, because I do think that is the strongest of the second signet possibilities here. If it was distance wielding, she would have popped into existence far, far, far away from Erasia. Don't you think Taryn would be like, where the fuck did you go? <laughs> like, what the hell happened? That is a really good point because their bond does weaken the further away that they are from each other. So I had not thought about that. I am personally leaning towards him, him meeting Zayden, coming in late at night and then leaving early, early the next morning. Yes, he does have days of growth on his face, but she does say days of growth. She doesn't say weeks of growth. So I feel like if it was, you know, plus a week, she would have said a lot longer than just days. I'm, yeah, I'm personally leaning that way. I do think it was a little confusing. I don't blame people for being confused. However, if this is a distance wielding moment, I do think there's another really, really, really big supporting distance wielding moment that is going to happen in episode 12. I'm going to be curious as to what this could mean or if this was just a Zayden pops in pops out. If it is a second signet, I've never really been on the time manipulation train one, but that could like that could True. easily be this or whatever she needs in the moment, which I think is the second signet that I am leaning more towards. I'm not exactly sure how that works with it being a signet power because it's a little bit too all powerful. But the way that she so focuses on his heartbeat being the comfort for her, she might have like in her mind needed him in that moment and he appeared not physically like actually there but like almost like a, a hallucination sort of yeah. thing. I don't know. I've never really thought about it that way. Maybe. I don't, I, the manifestation as the second signet, I do agree with you. It, there's going to have to be some kind of like limitations to it because if it is just you get whatever you want in the moment that is way too powerful I don't know I don't know I'm excited to find out though next we move into our runes scavenger hunt we learn that Sawyer actually lost his position as executive officer when they absorbed the flyers and the flyers squad at least version of their squad leader replaced him as EXO this does make me wonder though at the end of this book Sawyer has lost his leg is he going to be able to fight in combat or is he just going to be stationed at Bezgaith from here on out? We've speculated that he's going to have a hiccup-ish style mechanism like how to train your dragon style. I'm so hoping for this and to be quite honest I don't see Rebecca Yaros being like oh you don't have a leg now so you get to stay behind. Like I feel like it's going to be he's going to be the it's going to be the same thing for Sawyer. Well, I think it's going to be even cooler because remember, he can manipulate metal. That is his signet. Assuming that he's going to have a metal prosthetic, he can do some really stinking cool things unlike the normal person who lost their leg. I cannot believe I keep forgetting that he's a metal bender. Of course, that's so cool. So let's talk about what this ruins scavenger hunt is. Each group is assigned to a geographical sector to search for the hidden summoning runes. This is just as much of an exercise for the dragons as it is for the humans. The dragons are practicing their tracking skills as they attempt to sense these runes. So in this scene, Violet is in the middle of getting her download of what she needs to do for this runes escapade and she sees Zayden and Zayden and Violet, you know, run together and meet up and whatever. And we get another iconic Garrick line where Zayden's being all cryptic and whatever because Zayden, Shadow Daddy, whatever. And Garrick's like, oh, you need to tell her about how you took a venom out. And and Zayden's like, thanks, asshole. And Garrick's like, just trying to help you communicate in a stable relationship. Garrick is better at communication than these two. It's ridiculous. Ah, you know, Nicole, this show is sponsored by BetterHelp. (laughs) That's true. And you know, I give these two a really hard time, but communication has not been my strong suit in my relationship either. But something that I've been working on with my therapist is effectively communicating with Brett. And y'all, let me tell you... It's wildly helpful for a reason. In our recent AMA bonus episode, we talked about the importance of communication in relationships and how it doesn't only strengthen your relationships, but it also empowers your personal growth and mental well-being. Therapy can play a vital role in looking inward, identifying your own needs and expectations, and then understanding how to proactively and productively share that with your partner to instill better communication and connection. So if you're thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely on 
online and designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited for your schedule. All you need to do is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists at any time at no additional charge. So visit betterhelp.com slash FFG today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash FFG. Our crew is heading into the Aretian Caves, which used to be a network of caves that dragons use to protect the young and adolescent. Also, it's wintertime, which means there's a lot of snow Snow, and there's a mini avalanche that blocks the entrance that our foursome used to go into the cave. Uh, just a quick side note, because readers have called this out enough for it to be mentioned on the podcast. In the dark cave, Violet thinks to herself she's never been that good at producing mage lights. However, in Fourth Wing, she does note that she's actually very good at this lesser magic. So, hey, sometimes mistakes happen. Let's all move on. Whoops. <laughs> Sloane does indeed seem warm and fuzzy compared to Kat. We're starting to get to know and really like Sloane in part two of the story. I absolutely love her. Primarily over our mutual bonding over how insufferable Kat is being. Let's talk about Kat's tiny little redemption arc slowly beginning in the stretch of chapters two. Even as early as at Ree's family house, where Violet observes Kat is civil to everyone but her. I love how she explains the flyers share runes with each other. They each have their own expertise and they trade with each other. So everyone is equally equipped. What a great idea. And once again, it illustrates how power hungry and elitist the Dragon Riders act, even without realizing it. Runes were banned 400 years ago, practically for this very reason. The Dragon Riders didn't want equal footing of power. They wanted to hoard it for themselves and rely solely on each of their signets. Your signet is your identity. If you don't have a good signet, sucks for you. I do want to also point out props to Kat. I'm going to give credit where credit is due for having a moment of vulnerability because she admits that she hates that Violet has both all of this power and all of this control. And I'm just proud of her for admitting a weakness. Good job, Catriona. Well done. I also love that when they get into the cave and Darna tries to calm down Violet, who is having interrogation flashbacks with PTSD from this incredibly traumatic thing that happened to her only a few months ago. But she tries to calm her down by reminding her that Violet ended the person who kept her prisoner. This is an awesome way to bring up Varish right before his motherfucking dragon appears. And then another small but awesome moment here is when the torch starts to flicker, Violet notices that there's a breeze in a cave that shouldn't happen unless there's airflow meaning there's multiple entrances again just another beautiful way to set up Solus coming into our story again before he gets ended like a little squash bug now let's talk about the most casual but extremely important conversation in this cave. It starts with Vizia asking Violet if she thinks she'll get a second signet, which speaking for the entire fandom here, thank you Vizia, Violet pretty much assumed not because Andarna bonded her so young and then lost the ability to stop time. Violet even asks Andarna if she will get a second signet. And Andarna says, why are you asking me? Signets manifest according to the person wielding. Nicole, do you think that Indarna really has no idea or is she playing coy here? I think she's 100% playing coy. I think she knows. Absolutely, I think she knows. I wouldn't be surprised if Indarna knows that Violet's signet has even manifested. She's just being sneaky and quiet about it. And just like she has been, by the way, the entire book about her being a secret dragon den. So like, it's not against Indarna's morals to keep things quiet. The only logical reason I have here for this is because Violet's second signet is so powerful and rare. And Indarna is worried that if she like you know brings it up or if she starts to like wink wink hint hint that it's happening it would also tie into Andarna's secret with again because that signet is so powerful and rare it's coming from a very powerful and rare dragon thus starting to open up questions about where Andarna's from. If she is playing coy here, Andarna is very much of a Violet, you have to figure things out for yourself. I chose you because you are intelligent and you can figure out those things for yourself. So this also could be a way of her saying signets manifest according to the person wielding. And so it's almost like telling Violet to start thinking a little bit more critically about what second signet she would need. So anyway, it's so interesting. I I don't know if she knows or not. But then I know I said record scratch moment a little while ago, but this right here is the record scratch moment of the book. Oh my God. So Sloane nonchalantly drops the biggest piece of information. Second signets only happen when a dragon bonds a writer in the direct familial line as its previous dot, dot, dot. But there's an equal chance of it causing madness. What? (laughs) 
When I tell you, I get, I got heart palpitations reading this. I was freaking <laughs> out. Let us not forget, though, that earlier in this book, when we're right after the archives heist, we're talking to Quinn, and we learn half of this truth because she says that she bonded her great aunt's dragon, so she just got a more powerful signet because if she had bonded a direct descendant, she would have gone mad. She forgot or didn't know about the second signet part. So that was like the perfect setup for this mind blown drop that Sloan just did. I I don't care how many times I read this. I always get chills. While the big reveal is coming in a few chapters, this moment right here was when I thought, oh my God, Nicole was right. While we were speculating all the possibilities for Iron Flame, I ultimately did not believe that the Marked Ones had second signets because the Rebellion relics were not associated with a dragon channeling power to them. That was what I believed. So by default, I had to go with Zeta not having a second signet, and therefore he couldn't be an intrinsic. And in the best plot twist, it turns out that while I was right about the Marked Ones not having a second signet from a dragon relic, Nicole was right about Zayden being an intensic. So as soon as I realized that there is still a way to have a second signet, I knew. I fucking knew. I knew exactly what was coming, just like every other fantasy fangirl listener out there. I love it. There's that one clip that I have from me doing the like fucking traitor part of the fourth wing coverage. And this is before Iron Flame came out, so we had no idea. And I am just like losing it on just like sticking to my hill that I will die on that Zayden is going to have a second signet. And it's so funny because it's still trending every now and again. And so we'll get comments on that video being like, have they not read Iron Flame? And it's like, (laughs) look at the timestamp, people. I was right. (laughs) But I will never be able to describe the feeling that happened when I, because I was, I said this in the reactions episode. I'm going to say it again. When I was listening to this part of the book, I was cooking dinner and I'm like chopping an onion or something and Sloan drops that knowledge and I slipped, my hand slipped. I was terrified that I cut myself for a second, but I didn't, thank goodness. And I run to my book and I flippy, flippy, flip to this section and I just like forget about dinner and I just zero in for the rest of the night, basically. I think Brett came in and finished dinner for me because I was like, I can't, I have to read. Oh, it was so satisfying because I, like you, that the second we got that I was like oh my god he's an intrinsic we're getting this confirmation it's also just really great writing to insert this insane bit of information in the middle of a totally unrelated scene where Violet is silently grappling with this realization that second signets are possible and oh my god Zayden must have one and it's another Zayden secret but she also needs to focus on the task at hand so naturally the reader's attention diverts back to what's going on in the caves and it's a further setup for the big question she asks in a few chapters. I'm also really starting to lean heavily into the theory that Liam also had a second signet because Day previously bonded with one of his direct ancestors. My thoughts are that he shared this information with Sloan in his letters, and it also explains why Thort, Sloan's dragon, has been talking to her about these supposedly super secret Empyrean matters. Sloan was already aware of the second signet possibility, and she talked to her dragon about it, who then shared a little more information about the matter with her. So it it just, it all fits in a really crazy way. It's so funny. Like it's not confirmed by any means in the story, but it's, it fits too perfectly where like it just, it's there. It's, it's on the page. I'm 100% on the train with you. And I'll even point out that in chapter 56, when Violet starts guessing different signets, she says that Zayden can't be an element wielder or else he would have done so at Resin. Let us not forget that in the recent battle, Violet like, so, like just casually sees Liam wielding ice and it's just blown over immediately. This line right here is a direct mention to that line in the Resin battle. I do not think it was a mistake on editing or a mistake on grammar or anything like that it has to be that callback because or else why would that specific line be there why and and we know that people are going to say something so just have to insert this is that we also do not think that it was a third year wielding ice or anyone else wielding ice it is very explicit in the passage that it is Liam who is wielding ice and day means ice so it is not a coincidence that his dragon's name literally means ice and Liam was wielding ice and he also has a signet of farsight so in my opinion this is the best option yeah 
Agreed. I, I will say this with all the love of my heart. Doesn't matter because Liam is unfortunately no longer with us. <laughs> I know. It's like, it's so, it feels so good to like crack a mystery though, right? Like, it's, yeah, right? It's like, it's like, it's something so satisfying about it. Even though, yes, it technically does not matter. Side note, Thort, I really hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, does mean give in Scottish Gaelic, which is of course very fitting for Sloane's siphoning power that is about to manifest. Moving on in because this conversation about second signets does not last long. Guess who's back? Solus has entered the chat once again and immediately kills Visia. R.I.P. I guess she won't be going to Navarra to convince her family to leave for Erasia. Sad for Visia. Oh, that's so sad. Here we go with the bad dragon breath again. We're getting hung up on our bad dragon breath. Solus is described as having fetid breath. And if you don't know what fetid means, it's something smelling extremely unpleasant. So I wanted to quickly clear up some confusion from this scene because I was also under the impression too after my first read through. And Darna mentions the smell of stolen magic. And a lot of us have associated that with Solus's smell. However, she says wyverns smell like stolen magic. And what she's picking up here in the cave is the smell of dragons. So Solus does not in fact smell like stolen magic. However, his breath does still notably stink. Nicole, what were your thoughts about Solus coming back into our story? At first I was like, how the fuck did this dude make a reappear? I thought we had closed the chapter on Varish. I also thought we were going to learn more about Tarn and Solus's relationship I here. Too. I was really hoping for that. But am I happy that Solus came back solely for the purpose of him being off the table? Yes, because that dude be crazy. I do have a feeling that he came back into our story for the fetid breath comment. Hmm. And just to show how fucking unhinged this dragon has gone now that his rider is dead. I, yeah, I feel like there was a reason that it was Solus and it was to show us how this dude has lost his marbles. I will also follow up by saying it's a really good setup for Andarna being the one to kill him too. Yes. So like yeah. we, it's kind of, I won't say brushed off by any means, but it's passed over because there's so much else happening in the stretch of chapters that Andarna kills a dragon. And that's a yeah. big ass deal. And we're going to talk about that more in a second. But I, to your point, I do think it was there to be a part of Andarna's coming of age story. Yes, mm -hmm. indeed. Now I'm going to have to side with Zayden on the silliness of saving Kat because she's third in line for the poor yeah. meal crown. I, am I cruel where that doesn't feel like that should be a good enough reason to save her over Violet herself? I, if you are, I am too, because I thought the same fucking thing. Maybe this book is just really changing our morals. However, if you ask me, Violet's secondary reasoning for saving Kat is actually the root of why she risks her life to save Kat. Violet thinks that if Kat dies, it'll set off the chain reaction to Zayden dying because Takaris would execute him if Kat dies on Zayden's watch. Does it make sense in Violet's head? Yes, absolutely. She and Zayden both have tunnel vision when it comes to even the tiny bit close to protecting one another. So it makes sense that she would think this. Is it actually what would happen? I'm going to go with highly unlikely. I don't feel like Takaris would kill or be able to kill Zayden fucking Ryerson because his niece accidentally died during a class exercise. Visia just died and nobody's blinking an <laughs> eye. I, again, she's not third in line for the poor male crown, but this shit happens. Like people die. <laughs> I'm so sorry that I sound so cruel. <laughs> that's a great point about Visia. I didn't think about that. How like no one gave a shit that her bones are just just charred in the I know. <laughs> and again, she's not in line for the crown. But Takaris knows that Kat and all the others are at risk getting to Arisha and being in Arisha. Remember those cliffs that they had to hike up that was very dangerous? But again, it just it shows Violet's ultimate motive, which is to protect Zayden at all costs. And I can understand her line of thinking here, even if I don't agree with it. I also want to point out that all of Fourth Wing... All of Fourth Wing, Zayden was trying to protect Violet and keep her alive because the big bomb that's dropped after threshing. If Violet dies, then through the chain of events, Zayden dies. So why didn't that, like that was a major part of her first year is living to protect herself because if she does, if she dies, her boyfriend dies. So I'm just she, saying that if she dies here, Zayden would also die. Now she pushes down the bond of dragon. She's like, please live, please live. But that's not the same. That's not the same. But I will say, I do love 
that Kat does stay to help Violet as she's like, you know, shooting her arrows and stuff yep, like yep. that. I do feel like th- this is the beginning of a, you know, beautiful friendship between these two ladies. I do think that's where this is going to go in the story. It might take a while, but I do think that they are going to be friends and like a bonded pair by the end of it. I, I, th- that that small oversight really, really does get me. Uh, back to Sloane and this crazy, dangerous sequence because huzzah, our girl's signet manifests and she's a siphon. I love, love, love how powerful this makes her. And siphons, remember, are rare and powerful. So it's just like, good for you, Sloane. Ah, I love it. And it's a great tie-in to Venon and how they drain power because Sloane, understandably, initially thinks that's what she's accidentally doing. She's accidentally becoming a Venon with the way that she took power from Kat and then from Violet. I'm just going to say, I feel like there are quite a few parallels here between her and Naolin. So it's really interesting. You mean she's going to turn Venon just like we were assuming Naolin did? No, I'm, I'm for the record, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still a little confused on how siphoning works. And Alex, I, I might lean on you a little here because I need some ex- explaining. Because a few people have asked us, what's the difference between this Uno reverse signet that we've discussed about or the reflection signet and siphoning? And I think I need more understanding about the siphoning because here Sloane is draining Kat's power. She's draining Violet's power. Later on, she drains Lilith's power to siphon into the Wardstone. But if this is the case, how did Naolin, quote unquote, die siphoning power? Was there another mender around that he siphoned power into Brennan? Did he siphon Brennan's power and just like regurgitate it back into Brennan when he was on the brink of death? I don't understand how the siphon works. So so I'm going to take this as a two part question. So number one, just how does a siphon in general work? We don't know a whole lot about it. So the best way that I can describe it is that think of a siphon almost as the conduit. And so while Violet is pure pure power, pure energy, she cannot take that energy from others. She is the one who gives that energy. Now, siphons, on the other hand, they can absorb that power and then transfer it to someone else. They serve as a conduit of power themselves. So that is why, for instance, later on in this book, when she takes all of Lilith's power and her dragon's power, and it's almost like it's stored within her body, and then she immediately is able to push it back into the wards stone and that gave it enough imbued power which was a huge amount to then be able to activate it this is a similar situation here where she doesn't even realize that she's taking that power and storing it within herself now how does that work with naolin and bringing brennan back to life short answer i don't know i don't know exactly how that works if i had to guess it well first of all i don't think that there was like another mender there where he was able to take their power and then put that into brennan what i could absolutely see is him kind of taking that power from brennan and simultaneously putting it back into him i don't know how that works though i really yeah. don't and so that is why i'm really leaning more and more towards he did turn venon because he yeah. needed like that pure energy and it wasn't even necessarily mending brennan it was resurrecting him which That's requires true such a unique sense of power that is not supposed to be possible. Well, and we also have that rune on Brennan's palm, so we don't know exactly. if there's also like runes tied in. That's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah, I think that there's definitely more to it than just what we've seen here with what Sloane right. is able to do, but I don't know how yet. I also absolutely love that Violet is present when Sloane's signet manifests, and she talks her through it. Sloane is scared, and she doesn't understand what's going on, and Violet is right there to support her and help her understand. Liam would just be so proud and happy for his sister and his dear friend that they're able to experience this core memory together this core moment of someone's life you just know that Liam is watching and just like beaming oh god weeping I also find it fascinating that while Sloan is draining Violet she starts to scream now there could be two reasons for this one being the obvious she realizes she's draining and she's screaming of terror because she thinks she's turning venom the way I read it however is that she screamed because the amount of power the amount of electric power coming into her body was jarring causing her to freak out thinking that she's turning venom yet because remember when Jack fucking Barlow is holding Violet last year and he's channeling from the source it feels like the electric power is like going through Violet's body and she's just like screaming in pain so this could be a much uh, a similar-esque thing going on here which if this is the case I do want to point out just quick props to our girl Violet because if she has this power going through her body on a daily basis remember Taryn is 
fucking powerful. Whenever those doors open wide, she is like humming and like her skin is sizzling. And I'd imagine that that would be a quite literally a painful experience. It's just another tie-in to how Violet does experience pain on a daily basis. And pain is, it's pain is a Tuesday for Violet. So if Violet has just become so accustomed to that like regular occurrence of pain or electric power from Taryn and then Sloane experiences it and she starts screaming. I just thought that was a cool moment of also calling out Violet's pain tolerance. It's interesting you say that. I never thought of it as pain. It was just, it's always described as just power, but it is a very noticeable power that is always kind of coursing through her or especially like when she feels those strong emotions or when she lets her archives doors open but that's what I'm saying it's not described as pain because pain is just so normal to Violet so it is described as this like intense feeling but it's because it's just that level of experiencing pain is just it's so average I forget a lot of the times during this book that Violet does have a chronic illness like she does have to think about that constantly as she's going throughout her day this would just be another way of tying in how her power is also kind Kind of that constant hum of pain but she just doesn't really realize it all right and then ding dong the dragon's dead and darna slays solace which we later learn is a really big deal for a dragon to kill another dragon it leaves a mark on their soul and while Indarna is cleared by the elders because it was in defense it will still carry with her for the rest of her life before this book is over she will have killed both a bigger dragon and a venom showing she is not a dragon to be trifled with I love seeing Andarna step into her true badassery. Like this is not the last time we are going to see this constantly throughout Andarna's own hero's journey. But starting to see it really come to light in this book has been so cool. And this moment is just like the, I feel like it's like the real kickoff to her really embracing that, that inner violence side of Andarna. So fast forward out of the cave after the healers where Zayden and Violet are reunited. Look, we knew that Violet was a people pleaser, but you were in a meeting and I didn't want to bother you when she's like having a concussion on her bed. I just, that's just an all time wow moment from Violet. Also, they have dragons that talk to each other. She didn't think that Taryn would just be like, hey, mate of mine, my writer's pretty fucked up. You might want to tell your writer that his love is also pretty fucked up. It's just communication really takes another hit for these two. So, yep, Violet and Zayden, they are fighting again. But this argument, it's different. All the previous fights have led up to this big one because there is a specific question Violet has not asked Zayden. And yep, it's about the deal he made with her mother. She learns that Zayda knew that she knew he kept her alive her first year as a favor for her mom. Remember the reveal after he breaks her out of the interrogation chamber, Lilith allowed Zayden and the Marked Ones to live and try to survive the writer's quadrant. In exchange, she had a blank check favor that she could call in whenever she needed. Five-ish years later, she calls in this favor, keep my daughter alive in the writer's quadrant. And Violet, naturally, has some feelings about this secret deal Zayden Nez never mentioned. Because it's just one more reason that he had to keep Violet alive. One more way that his life is tethered to her survival. And she feels like their love story, it's tainted. Because suddenly her, her mom, of all people, plays a central role in why he didn't originally kill her when he very well wanted to. I get Violet feeling resentful about this and insistent on, quite frankly, not wanting to broach this subject. Remember that she roots herself in facts and knowledge. Everything about their relationship, or at least the start of their relationship, feels like a lie now. It feels like all of that knowledge about Navarre is being ripped out from under her, except for this time it's with her partner. He has been the center of her gravity this whole book. And opening up this question makes it real that the start of their relationship was not their own. So yes, I get her wanting to avoid this question. And Zayden bringing it up in the middle of a screaming match is not a kind thing to do, my guy. While everyone, and even the Venon, know that Zayden and Violet are a pair, whether they're together or separate, you know what another way is that you can show that you and your boo are a united front what's that nicole matching underwear (laughs) just in time for valentine's day because even if you're arguing like zayden and violet are about to do everyone deserves to celebrate love and comfort which is where me undies comes in with insanely comfy yet sexy undies and loungewear to buy or gift this holiday they've got so many awesome valentine's day prints all of their products will make you just plus get matching undies with your boo for that extra special holiday treat you and them matching undies magic waiting to happen actually brett 
and I have a pair of matching me undies. Not only are they super cute, but they're super soft and you know, they're sexy too. They're fun. I had so much fun picking out which underwear prints to get. There's one with books on it, which I really loved, or characters from your favorite movies, all sorts of food prints. And of course, there's great color options too. all of my favorite colors. Literally, there are so many possibilities. I really and truly don't know how you can pick just one. Me undies signature fabric is as soft as a warm hug from your favorite sweater. It's breathable, stretchy, and oh so comfy, making it the ideal all day wear. And they use sustainably sourced materials and work with partners that care for their workers. So this Valentine's Day, give the gift that'll always have them thinking of you and get 20% off your first order plus free shipping at meundies.com slash FFG. That's meundies.com slash FFG for 20% off plus free shipping. Me Undies comfort from the outside in. But before we dive into this heavy heated argument, I do want to address something small in the chapter 55 epigraph. It says, nothing kills powerful, unshakable love faster than opposing ideologies. This is from Warwick's journal. And I didn't really think of anything the first few times I read this, just because, you know, we're about to get into two people having this exact thing happen. But this time it made me pause because who did he have opposing ideologies with? Lyra. So were Lyra and Warwick in love, but the opposing ideologies of keeping the knowledge of the Navarian wards a secret, or at least massively cryptic, did that drive a wedge between them and that caused them to, for lack of a better term, break up? I, I definitely think that because sense, then yeah. we learned later in Lyra's journal in an epigraph, I don't have it in front of me, so I'm paraphrasing here, but essentially said that it cost her everything. I'm going to guess that the, the other five of the first six do not know that she left that documentation, but when she was trying to advocate for that knowledge to be shared, they were like, no, 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 no. And then that is why she had to then go secret. Oof. I just never thought about it in a way that they were together. I love that little twist. Yep. Yeah. I also have some feelings about this bigger argument that ensues between Zayden and Violet. Zayden's reasoning that he did not tell Violet because he was waiting for her to ask and not just ask, but want to ask and face her fears. He saw this as a test of her trust in him. When she was ready to ask, she would be ready to hear the answer and therefore ready to open her heart to loving all of him big air quotes on all because he did not think she would ever ask about a second signet. But anyway, Violet, on the other hand, she's furious at this game that Zayden is playing and how he is turning this around on her. And as frustrating as these two fights can be, I really respect how Rebecca does the dialogue. She does a fantastic job capturing these conflicting feelings, none of which are black and white in simplicity. In my reread, I was highlighting in blue what I agreed and understood and highlighted in yellow what made me shake my head. And the truth is, there was a lot of blue and yellow in this argument. Because while I understand Zayden's motivation and underlying reasons to rely on Violet asking the questions, he still treated it like a game. And at a certain point in your relationship, in your communication, in your love, you leave those kind of mind games at the door. This, like all of this. I actually saw this section of the outline because you were a little bit further ahead of me when we were outlining this episode. And I thought that was really interesting. So I actually decided to do the same blue and yellow color coding in my ebook. And I had about two thirds blue, maybe a little over two thirds blue and one third yellow. For me, this wasn't entirely surprising. I never got annoyed with the arguments in this book. It felt very genuine and honestly, very on point for our characters and where they are in their story. So I'm not surprised. The few things that made me shake my head were just when Zayden was being an absolute alpha hole and idiot. So those are really the only things that made me really quote unquote SMH. But I agree with you on your point of the masterful level of dialogue here. I think it's communicated so well what the root of their problems are with each other. So yeah, I think this scene is beautifully done. And so I'm going to kind of start splitting some hairs here. So in Violet's defense, she didn't know what to ask. And it was absolutely stupid how he was being all, I'll tell you whatever you want. You just have to ask the question. But then in Zayden's defense, she did know this particular question to ask. And she avoided it because she didn't want to dig deeper into their issues and face the conflict in their relationship. But then in Violet's defense, she's pissed that he kept this from her when he knew it was eating her up inside instead of insisting on making her ask for things a normal person would openly share. Because yeah, it's unfair that Zayden is putting this entirely on her and saying she needs to ask him why he doesn't regret letting her live because of the favor or about the first time they saw each other and all these other things where it's like, dude, 
you could just tell her this as well. However, in Zayden's defense, you noticing a pattern here? Violet hasn't fought back in the same way since he broke her trust last year, and she hasn't fully gained back her trust in him. Answering whatever questions she asks is a surefire way to earn back her trust and rebuild the depth of their relationship. But then, in Violet's defense, Zayden takes the armoire metaphor way too far to prove his point. Like, I read that and I was like, Zayden, my guy, Dial it back. (laughs) But then in Zayden's defense, she is the smartest person he knows. And if she truly wants the answers, one to fight for their relationship to the level she says she is asking of him, she would know what questions to ask. I could go on and on, but you get the point here. Bottom line, I agree with Zayden's end goal. However, I do not agree with his process of getting there. And I'm definitely going to have to side with Violet on the whole frustration of these questions. There's other ways of better communication that isn't this mind game Zayden. There's a few moments I want to pull out from this scene because woof. The first is the armoire analogy. I love that this analogy came back into our story, but like Lexi said, boy oh boy does Zayden take this way too far, at least in our opinion. So in case you need a refresher, Violet says that their relationship is like an armoire. And if a battle axe flew out of that armoire and almost killed you, you would want to go check out the armoire fully to make sure that there are no more battle axes in there. But just like Zayden notes, taking their real life shared armoire into this analogy, Violet hasn't gone searching through their relationship armoire. She says it's because she didn't want to go snooping. Her analogy is crumbling in front of her eyes right now. But it's because she trusts him that there are no more battle axes in there. But then, <sighs> Zayden, Zayden takes a dagger and holds it a few <laughs> inches away from her neck. And he asks, like, all up in her face, am I going to hurt you? She says, I know you're not going to. So Zayden's point here, while dramatic, is simple. There are knives and other battle axes in their metaphorical armoire, but she knows that even if it did come out flying again, he would never use those battle axes to hurt her. Basically saying, ask the questions, Violet, because even if the information is equivalent to a battle axe, he would never hurt her with said information. And it narrows down to his last point. Violet doesn't trust herself to be able to handle this information or at least be able to handle it in their relationship and not spiral down with it. Zayden really laid on the dramatics though. Like he did not need to hold a dagger to his girlfriend's neck. That's or than his own. Then he does it to himself. (laughs) And Violet like takes it and throws it to the floor. And I just, oh my God. The only other thing I'm going to totally do a 180 here is in this scene, I love how Zayden calls Violet love. Zayden says, love, you're the smartest person I know. This is my official declaration of request to add the nickname love to the please use this more in books. Thank you. But then... Violet does ask the ultimate question, the one that makes a fandom and especially fantasy fangirl listeners go, oh my fucking God, because we know where this is going. Nicole, would you like to do the honors? I would love to do the honors. Quote, let's put your theory to the test. You want me to demand the truth to ask you something real? What's your second signet? Mike, drop my girl. And this causes the blood to drain from his face, leaving Zayden Ryerson in shock. This moment was delicious. <laughs> she mentions how bonding a dragon who also bonded a direct descendant will produce either a second signet or madness. And she says, quote, you seem pretty sane to me. I just want I just want to point out that this is the man who held a dagger to her neck. Not even five minutes ago, but sure, let's go with sane. But I can't help but wonder, we've heard this, it causes madness multiple times in this book. Is this foreshadowing for someone going mad from this type of bond? And if so, who? My first reaction was, I wonder if Naolin bonded a direct descendant, and that's why he, you know, went mad and possibly turned Venom, at least as we suspect. Now, also, maybe it's not a or you go mad. Maybe it is an and you go mad, and we just don't know it. And this is actually foreshadowing for Zayden going mad as a Venom, which is terrifying to think of, but I have to throw it out as a possibility. I do think that it is definitely some kind of foreshadowing of somebody going mad from this. I don't know if it's a character that we know yet either. Like, remember, we are only on book two of five books here. So, but I do wonder if it is an and 
for because again it's so all so unknown this is such unknown magic because it is not allowed for a reason because violet decided to wait a week to do something about raising the wards which you know know how we feel about that now they're in a major hurry to get them up as the horde of wyvern are literally flying towards them don't worry we'll dive into the ins and outs of ward zones in today's archive section so we're going to keep this a little bit briefer because we're not going to be going into those ins and outs right now. As they approach the Wardstone, it's notable that Taryn is standing by Segale like Violet always expects. It sets up for the rift between them when he learns that Segale kept Zane's secret from him. I also find it notable that Rhiannon is with them. That means that Fierge is the strongest green dragon in Eurasia. Go Fierge! And also Dane is there with Kath, so Kath must be the number one red dragon. I also want to point out that Violet, now having read the whole book knows that they made two wart stones, which answers my question from an earlier episode of how many wart stones did they make? It, it is two. She also found out that if a dragon breathes on one wart stone, they cannot breathe on another. Of course, setting up the conflict at the end of this book with having to choose between Bezgaeth or Eurasia, two wards since there's only one on Darna in, you know, the seventh den. And also notably, it does not say why they never activated the Eration Wardstone, which is a fun mystery for us to figure out. But again, Violet, this is why we read the whole book, not just the juicy bits. After the dragons breathe their fire and the pulse of magic means that the wards work, there are several clues that it didn't work entirely that we really catch on a reread. So for instance, the feeling is slightly softer than the one that rippled out at the emergence of Arisha's first hatchling. And then another one is the wild unleashed magic that the writers feel beyond the wards, quote, seems to sit back, not weaker, but infinitely more dot 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 tame. Another one is the stone does look exactly the same as it did before. There is no lingering fire which we realize is extremely important once we go to Beskaith but it does look the same even if it does have that hum of power and that feeling of the wards being in place love the moment after the ward stone seemingly activates and her and Dane share a smile it really I mean they've been working hours and hours and days and nights on decoding this journal and it just you know little teamwork makes the dream work moment between two people god damn it Dane! i can't believe i'm starting to like you again <laughs> thankfully this did do something we might know now in hindsight that it was not fully activating but oh my gosh it did something and that means that they got to get moving here they do not have time to test this wards out a few hours later violet and taryn reach the edges of the wards before segale and zayden because taryn can fly really really fast once again taryn points out to violet that he chose her for her judgment this has been a common theme in their bond that i have to wonder if it's a reminder for something bigger coming in the series. Is this just Taryn having an ego to who he chooses to bond? Very, very likely. But it's also definitely a nod to Violet having good judgment in saving a feather tail and fighting those assholes back at Threshing, remember? I just, I have to wonder if there's more to it and all this mention is priming us for something. I don't know what, but something. I have nothing I have no idea, but I agree. <laughs> Violet wonders if this area would be the natural border of Bezgaeth's wards if they hadn't extended them with the outposts. But she notes that if that's the case, Elsum, Tyrandor, and most of Caldir would be unwarded. Caldir, don't forget, is the capital of Navarre. It's where the king lives. It's important place, I would argue. This might be priming us for an unwarded Caldir. If we somehow do get the boosters, I'll call them, from the outposts, if they somehow do go down, I wonder if Caldir is going to be unwarded. And at some point, if King Tauri is going to get got by a horde of venom. I don't think King Tower is making it out of book three alive. I really don't. Oh, book three. I think it's he's going to be an early, or at least in the first half of the series, death. But wait, Segal and Zayden approach. Oh. And I just, I love the line, I breathe in my last moments of peace and prepare myself for the battle to come before the actual war reaches us. Anyone who has ever been in a dreaded argument with their partner understands this feeling to their core. <laughs> you know that text of like, we need to talk and yeah. then that feeling right before you walk into the room or wherever you're meeting up with them of just like okay no matter what happens I'm gonna be okay like that terrified feeling this is the fantasy version of that feeling of the we need to talk text which is just cruel please never send someone that text it's evil Zayden is very distressed he's caught between a rock and a hard place he never imagined Violet would ask him this question about having a second signet 
But to Violet's point, he did share the information with her that Sigail bonded his grandfather. I love that like consciously or unconsciously he wanted her to know at some level because he does want her to know all of him. I think it's unconsciously. I don't think it's consciously. Absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. And then the most iconic conversation ensues. Take it away, Nicole. I want a moment of silence for the second most devastating line in this book. The most devastating line happens in just a few moments. Quote, how long does it take for someone to fall out of love? A day? A month? This sounds like a really good indie song. Like the lyrics to a really good indie song. But that's how our dude Zayden is feeling right now. It's so tragic. That's why he's so... Like she even mentions how she takes her bond, the shield, her shields down from the bond a second, and she feels ice cold terror. That is not three words we ever associate with Zayden Ryerson. And Violet, she wonders if his signet is like cats where he can manipulate emotions. And he responds that he would never do something like that. And then Violet says she didn't realize she said that out loud because, hey, she didn't. And then Zayden doesn't respond. He knows that this is coming. He knows what is about to happen here. And he is absolutely petrified. When I tell you that I screamed (laughs) when I read this, this is Rebecca saying, hey, Every time that happened last year, when she said something in her head with no italics, <laughs> with no italics, and he responded to her, that was him reading her intentions. The satisfaction of this is so delicious. I love that she included that just to confirm it in our minds. But also later, he says that he hadn't read her intentions since she was more to him than the general's daughter that he was supposed to protect. But he does it right here. So my guess is that he has not intentionally (laughs) gone snooping through her head since then. But with their bond, like he says, sometimes it's easy for her to just like slip her intentions down the line. And this is just one of those moments. Same with every time they have sex and he accidentally reads her mind. (laughs) In the midst of Violet guessing, she asks about distance wielding. One of the rarest signets where only two writers in history have been able to cross hundreds of miles in just one step. We've had quite a few listeners kind of ask ask how in the world does that work the two best ways of describing that are for instance like in Harry Potter with apparating where it's like you are in one spot and then boom you're in another spot could be hundreds of miles away or if you're familiar with Akatar, you know winnowing or teleporting from Crescent City it's essentially the same thing as all of that there now this line about distance wielding has the fandom really hung up we believe that is definitely foreshadowing that we will see a distance wielder whether that is possibly Violet herself or another character. I'm personally gunning for Arik. But staying on topic here with Zayden and her conversation, she starts eliminating signets, including no element wielding because she would have seen that in Resin. I do believe that this goes beyond elemental wielding. If Zayden's signet was showy, for lack of a better word, she or someone else would have seen it in battle by now. She also mentions that there's no sound seekers that can hear across miles of distance like Captain Greeley, who is in Melgren's personal unit. That's just such a toss away line that I do not think is a toss away line. This is highly troubling. And I bet this person, Captain Greeley, will use this signet in a later book to overhear something that our characters do not want to be heard. And then Zane essentially tells Violet without outright telling her. I'm just gonna like crack my knuckles and get on my soapbox for a second because it is time. Zane saying no one knows because if they did, I'd be dead. Chef's kiss from Rebecca Yaros. We've known about the intrinsic signet since early in chapter one of fourth wing. That's how early this signet is mentioned. It is immediately followed up, however, in that chapter with the fact that it's a death sentence. In the scene, Violet remarks on even how accusing someone of being an intrinsic would be equal to sending them to their death. To have Zayden, a deadly creature harbor the deadly signet where he would be killed in any moment it's just perfection I mean Violet even says quote Zayden is more dangerous than I ever imagined now Jacinia is writing this book so eventually at least she will find out but will other people find out as well I do think so I think we're gonna have some inner you know inner circle finding out moment whether that's Brennan or Bodhi or Garrick I do think that some inner circle people are gonna find out but when we have no idea I guess would be book three. But after Zayden says it without really saying it, there's a line that says, quote, he has to intrinsically know who to trust. For anyone who has not written the word intrinsic on their phone, on a Google Doc, or in the podcast captions for editing, it 
always corrects intrinsic to intrinsic. So in my head canon, this is Rebecca's fuck you to word for always changing that word, the word intrinsic to intrinsic, which is just chef's kiss good. But the way that Violet figures out that this is Zayden's second signet is, quote, Zayden has to know dot, 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 everything. Zayden's most pressing need is information. Remember that signets are what a person needs at their core. Zayden does need to know everything. Remember, he was doing a heist of stealing daggers from Bezgaeth, where he would have been killed instantly for this information. Now, a lot of people in Bezgaeth, probably the people who would kill him, would have their shields up. But still, it's important to know that this is why Zayden's second signet did manifest. Now, for many, one of the real shockers of this scene was Tarn not knowing about this signet. We addressed this in a recent post we did on social media, so I'm going to keep this nice and brief. But many thought that Tarn's quote, do not dare to try to read me human line from fourth wing was a nod to him knowing about Zayden's second signet. But Lexi and I think that line was more to call out how Zayden and Tarn did not use their bond before Tarn bonded Violet and thus connecting the four of them into this fearsome foursome. Seeing Tarn's betrayal here is heartbreaking. And yet it's a good wake up call for our girl Violet to realize how shielded Zayden has been about this information. Even Segale couldn't tell her mate about it. That is unheard of in in Empyrean land. And Violet doesn't feel like she's the last to know here. So it does kind of ease this blow a little bit. I love the moment where Violet takes a step back and quote, he moves as if he takes the step with me. In the next paragraph, he mentions how this signet is what makes him a good fighter because he can see the opponent's moves right before they take them so he can almost take the movement with them thus knocking them off their game he's literally doing this taking the step with violet in this moment i just love that that line right there it's just so cool it shows how casually he does use this intrinsic signet now violet says that he's an intrinsic and zayden says he's a type of intrinsic. It's time to talk about it. I love that when he says this to Violet, Violet mentions how it sounds like he's never spoken the words out loud before because he hasn't. He has never spoken this out loud to anyone, which like, God, what a burden to bear Zayden Ryerson. But in the ever so famous Variety article, which honestly, I should just have bookmarked at this point. We have given so much money to Variety for page views on that thing. I can't even tell you. Rebecca confirms that the ice prickling at her scalp moments in fourth wing were all the intrinsic moments that Zayden was reading her mind. But she also says this, and I'm quoting this entire thing. Quote, what I love about this is that he says it's a type of intrinsic, but they don't have any alive. So how does he know exactly what he is? How does he know if that's full? How does he know what it is? He has no clue. They have no intrinsics alive, so he has no idea what he is. Is it intentions? Is it words? Is it thoughts? He has no clue. Are you getting the point across (laughs) from this people? He has no clue. It's true. So what all does this mean? Does this mean that there are no types of intrinsics? Does it mean that he is a full intrinsic? intrinsic and he hasn't honed it beyond intentions and in actuality is Zayden's signet here way more powerful than he ever could know what are your thoughts here Lex yes I'm gonna go with definitely as a fandom a lot of us are very confused about how his signet works which is understandable because he is even a little bit confused about how it works Violet is confused about how it works because there is no one alive to provide any direction to train to to be able to discuss this with him and so I think that this is Zayden essentially convincing himself that it's not as scary as it might seem like he needs to tell himself these things and I'm sure that Sigail is right there kind of coaching through it with him but I'm willing to guess that she also doesn't know exactly what it means and so what I really do love however is that he focuses so much on the intention before the actual thought so if you remember with Jeremiah when his it manifested he was literally repeating what everyone else was saying around him he wasn't tapping into any kind of intention now again this was the moment that his signet manifested and we know that's just kind of a crazy moment for anyone whose signet is manifesting I think that Zayden because he's able to read not just the conscious thought but the subconscious behind that thought makes him even more powerful than he knows because somebody can't trick him into just thinking what they want him to think because he knows the intention behind that that is a good fucking point I had not even come close to think about it I agree with you completely I think that Zayden is just a really powerful intrinsic I do not think he's a type 
of intrinsic. I think he's a really powerful untrained intrinsic. And I have a feeling that he is going to learn how to be an intrinsic somehow or another going forward in this book series. And I have a feeling it's going to come from the dark wielding side of him. I don't think it's going to come from Navarre or the quote unquote good side. Well, and on that note, without getting too far ahead of ourselves here, in the final chapter, he does feel like his shadows are stronger. He feels like his signet is more powerful. And I'm going to assume that that also translates over to his intrinsic (gasps) ability, too. What if he can break through shields? (gasps) Wouldn't that be crazy? That would be amazing. Oh, my God. I can't wait. So last few little things on this intrinsic download moment which is just so beautiful as violet starts to spiral zayden says the four words that took my i won the bet from lexi smugness to complete sorrow for our characters here because zayden says quote less than a minute that's how long it took you to fall out of love with me what is it with rebecca yarrow's and four words that make my heart rip open between it's been my honor between I won't, I swear, and less than a minute. These four words just absolutely gut me. When Violet is trying to figure out how many daggers are left in that, quote, metaphorical armoir, Rebecca Yaros has mentioned that the reason she couldn't write any more Zayden POVs is because of this secret. So I am personally inclined that there are no more metaphorical daggers in this armoire of theirs. I do not think that there are any more that they know about, I should say. I do think that there are some that they don't know about, like Zayden having a sibling, whatever the fuck's going to happen next with Zayden being a Venon. But I do think that this was the last big secret for Zayden to unveil to his girl Violet. But then Zayden terrified he begs violet to say something and she says my love isn't fickle again four words that kill me we'll do a little mini huzzah like so i will actually say because i think that the weight of the you know less than a minute like that like it was so gut-wrenching and then within a few pages she counters that so i appreciate violet for really just sticking true in this moment where it's like you know what i'm going to tell you right now that while we definitely do have some problems i still love you and that's really important because he needed to hear that but it also kind of dims the severity and the sadness of that whole you know how long does it take someone to fall out of love because she essentially says I, this is a problem, but we're going to work it out together. But I see it more as Zayden saying, this is how heavily this has been weighing on my heart. And almost like a uh, him being the tragic character here and how he has been eaten up by this alive and Violet saying, I see you, but I accept you as you are. Maybe we got some shit to figure out, but yeah, I accept Yeah, that's you what as I'm saying too. And But he doesn't realize that when he says less than a minute. So that's what I'm saying. The weight of less than a minute really comes from him feeling um, like how, how intense this has been of a secret for him to keep. I see what you, yes. It's more of a reflection on him and his feelings rather than projecting that onto Violet. Okay, I yes. absolutely agree with you then. But then... There's a subtle roar that's been just, you know, twittering in Violet's ears and she thinks it's just her heartbeat in her head because she's seeing red basically at this point. But no, those are wing beats. Hey everyone, remember that horde of wyvern that is supposed to be coming towards them? As Taryn eloquently says, we will settle matters of emotion after matters of life. Because 17 venom, 17, 17 venom slow at the other end of the wards and they're essentially having a standoff here to quote violet that's unfortunate (laughs) also violet notes that she's terrified to call what they're flying in a formation this is notable this means that they have military structure this is not just chaos and venom land this is they know how to fly in a v which means they have plans they have venom plans well, and the Venon are absolutely controlling them, too. So there's a real strategy behind this. The Venon are strategic. They are smarter than probably our crew has given them credit for here. I remember holding my breath at this point in my first read because it's like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, the words have to work. Like, they have to work, like, or they're just dead. Like, they have to have worked or they're dead. And since there's still more of this book, it's like, okay, like, the words have to work. They have to work here. But how the heck is this going to play out here? I thought they were going to get captured. I thought that this was a moment where Zayden and Violet were going to get captured by the Venom. I bet that's exactly what would have happened because (laughs) the sage from Resin, the one who has been plaguing Violet's nightmares, he is front and center. And I quote, his head turns noticeably from me, dot, 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 to Zayden. I love that Violet says he was in Resin and Zayden comes back with, I know. 
Now, we should note, the Venon in Zayden's dreams was a blue-robed general, not this sage. But I do wonder if, because we only saw one of his dreams. We know that he has had many. Is this sage one of them who has been plaguing his dreams and he's just had multiple characters? You know, I need to go back through and reread the fourth wing battle sequence again, because I also wonder if there was something going on between Zayden and the sage there, because the sage obviously wants him like everybody wants Zayden ultimately here. Yeah, they do. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, that's a good point. Because then the sage, he swings his staff and points it at our duo, which we can guess is his way of directing these wyvern, which quick note here, a lot of people, especially those on the UK side, have been like, you guys are pronouncing wyvern wrong. And I'm like, I have never heard another way of pronouncing it. And then I started listening to the Throne of Glass series. And it's like, oh, they pronounce it differently. So this is going to be interesting for us. And so when the sage directs the wyvern to to go towards the wards here, Zayden starts saying his goodbyes. I love that Taryn is like, Do not speak to her as if death is a possibility. I don't know, my guy. 17 Venom is pretty possibility of death. At least possibility of death to me. I think that just show like how sure Taryn is of both the wards and their abilities. And he is such a dad here where it's like to the boyfriend who just shattered her heart. It's like, do not talk to her right now. We got to stay focused here. Goodbye. (laughs) But right as the wyvern fly at Taryn and Violet, once it crosses the wards, the wyvern sags and it's like someone plucked out its life force, which we'll learn later that it only means that they're technically dead. More on that in next week's episode. We'll have a lot to say about that. He's only mostly dead. (laughs) Without the ability for his wyvern to pass the wards, the sage calls off the attack. And as Violet says, it's pretty anticlimactic. When I was first doing my read here, I was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And then it's kind of like, then this happens and it's like oh okay cool you know similar events occurred along the rest of the cliffs and our crew learns that this was a coordinated simultaneous attack the venom were trying to swarm arisha and thank god there were wards a lot to say about that too but hey we got there in the end our story would literally be over if they didn't get those wards up zayden and violet they're good i don't know if they could have fought against 17 venom and definitely everyone else couldn't have held the line against the hordes of wyvern and the army of venom that literally surrounded the borders of these wards here it's interesting here because do we think that the Ress and Sage knew where Violet and Zayden were and he went there to encounter them? It's very specific that it is a Sage that they know that meets them when there are a whole lot of other attacks going on too. Yes, I do think the Sage knew that this was 100% what he was doing. You mentioned earlier that you think that he would have captured them. I wholeheartedly agree. I think that the Venon he would have taken both Zayden and Violet alive. This is really the first time that we get a clue that they are after Zayden when that noticeable turn of his head is from Violet to Zayden. It is such a pointed line and it's the first time we learn that they might be after Zayden even more so than Violet. Back in Arisha, as everyone celebrates, Violet is trying to start processing the massive bombshell that Zayden has dropped on her. Remember that whole intrinsic thing that happened before the Wyvern and Venom came? And there's more news. General Melgren wants to meet with them in Athbane tomorrow. He insists on no more than two marked ones coming to this meeting, which means he knows if there will be a battle, it goes his way. I'm still a little iffy on exactly how General Melgren's signet works. When it comes to that premonition and all of that, it's, it's a little muddled waters there so we'll leave that for a different discussion for a different day but hey there's even more news the griffin flyers can still wield which yay for them but that means something's wrong with the wards so in the moment i was like hey isn't this kind of the best of both worlds everybody the wyvern wait wait, you can't say that and not have the hannah montana reference in there i don't know the hannah montana reference i am so disappointed in you oh my god you get the best of both worlds (laughs) The wyvern can't cross the wards without dying, and it's holding off the venom. Plus, the flyers can steal wield, which, as you all remember, was kind of a big deal and why the wards were not up sooner. But the truth is that this is a very short-term solution. As we learn in the next stretch of chapters from Lilith, these Arishan wards will decline over time into nothing. So yes, right now they're in good shape, but soon enough these wards will dissolve and not work, leaving them right back to square one. Something I just thought of is... If Indarna is wanting to continue on the line of the seventh dragon den, she would have to 
you know, do the dirty with someone else. But can she do the dirty with someone who's in a different dragon den and have it still be in the seventh dragon den? (laughs) I'm laughing because we've gotten this question from a lot of listeners. And the truth is, I have no fucking idea. I have no idea idea how this would work (laughs) with like even like Taryn and Sigil bonding and then like nobody ever knows what color a dragon is going to be I I have no idea I don't know maybe if you mate or do the dirty outside of your dragon den you don't get that's the birth control like that's how that you don't get pregnant that way I don't yeah I don't don't know the answer I don't know the answer (laughs) this reminds me of the I'm reading about dragons I'm reading I'm reading about dragons fucking each other (laughs) what a world we live in before we move into our foreshadowing moments I do want to do a quick gravity count because an unsurprising moment of gravity shifting for our girl Violet is when Sloane's download hits in the cave about getting a second signet it's literally gravity shifts under my feet so gravity count six Nicole do you think that her second signet could have something to do with gravity a lot of listeners do think that if it does I don't know what that how that would work I will say it does feel very true to Violet with that but I do think that others make more sense in this world so I'm not saying no by any means I'm saying that there are other possibilities that I think are more clear and this one feels more symbolic I agree I don't know yeah. what the second signet would look like if gravity was the center of it it's, it's certainly just because we aren't creative enough to figure that out doesn't mean Rebecca isn't so <laughs> throw us under the bus <laughs> Now let's move on into the foreshadowing section. We've already, of course, talked about quite a bit, but let's pull out a few other nuggets from this stretch of chapters that show some foreshadowing. Indarna and Taryn arguing over Indarna's right of benefaction. Indarna clips back at him saying, it's a good thing you're not the head of my den then, isn't it? To which Taryn mentions, Coda should have known better. Grumble, grumble. (laughs) But Coda is not the head of Indarna's den. She is. But also note that Violet interrupts this conversation again right before possible information could have been shared. When in the cave, Kat says to Violet, who is surprised that she carries a torch around, quote, the fact that you don't means you haven't been appropriately scared of the dark yet. This is such cool foreshadowing symbolism considering Zayden. Our dark shadow daddy is someone who, by the end of this book, we all should be afraid of. And in Darna, she might not have the ability to breathe fire in the cave scene, but she will gain the ability to breathe fire at a very crucial moment later in the final battle. Zayden's mother made him a blanket that's tucked on the top shelf of their armoire. What? It's another little nugget of info about Zayden's mom. But this one, surprisingly, is all warm and fuzzy and emotional. Another promise that we will learn more about her and their very complicated relationship. Violet wonders why this Arishan Wardstone was never activated and Warwick's journal doesn't say why it wouldn't be. Well, because she's wrong in that they do not have enough dragons. Something happened with the seventh den and the first six and beyond did not have access to a second dragon from Andarna's den to have a complete set of dragons to fully activate this Wardstone and Arisha. We don't have a lot of hints about what happened to Andarna's den, but I think she was left behind in case Navarre ever needed to reactivate one Wardstone, which it obviously does by the end of the book. Now, let us step into the archives where each episode, Lexi educates us on a prominent world building topic from this stretch of chapters. Today's archives topic is the Wardstones. Whew, buckle up, friends, because this is quite the archives. Big shout out to our community moderator and friend, Brooke, for double checking my work and filling in a few holes. It's really, really helpful to have a second pair of eyes on this as I provide you all with all of the information. What is a Wardstone? A Wardstone is a giant magical object, kind of like a statue, that projects protective wards that extend across far distances when activated. What the hell does that mean? What are the wardstone's benefits and why are they so essential? The wardstone is the source of the wards that cover Navarre. It is absolutely essential to Navarre's defense and its primary way of protection for the past 600 years. Remember that umbrella analogy that Mira gave Violet earlier? The wardstone is the stem of the umbrella and the wards take the shape of a dome around Navarre. The spokes are the strongest at the stem, at the wardstone, and they get weaker the farther they branch out. The further away from the wardstone, the weaker the wards are and therefore 
they need a power boost from the alloy, which is why all of the outposts have alloy. This is how the wards get stretched to their limit and extend about twice as far as they would otherwise without that extra alloy power boost. Alloy expands the ward's natural distance that the ward stone offers and helps it maintain a strong defense. Without the outposts boosting the wards, Bisgaius ward stone's ward distance would leave Elsum, Tyrandor, and even most of Caldir, the capital of Navarre, unwarded. See our alloy archives for more information about how the extended wards are powered. Once our crew semi-activates the Arisha ward stone, it creates wards that stretch about four hours away from Arisha at the cliffs of Draylor, so its natural range still doesn't shield most of Tyrandor, but to Nicole's point, something is better than nothing and we can get those poor million refugees in there and we can actually have a defense. Only dragon magic works within the wards. No other magical being's power works within these wards. Remember, griffin flyers lose their ability to wield. Wyverns are dark magic, so they just drop dead within the wards and venom have extremely limited power within the wards we'll learn a lot more about how all of that works with the venom and wards in book three navarre chose to use their dragon's protective magic to its advantage and erected these wards around the kingdom blocking everyone else out poor meal the isles and venom alike for its self-preservation so where are these ward stones and what do they look like to our knowledge there are two ward stones in existence we know that the first six didn't just establish the wards but they personally carved the first wardstone at Biscayeth, so we can assume they also carved the one in Arisha. Speaking of which, let's talk about these two wardstones. The one in Arisha has always been dormant and it's never been activated to create wards until now. You access this wardstone by walking down a canyon which opens up into a circular chamber that can comfortably fit at least 10 dragons, which include huge dragons like Terran and Segale. So friends, like this chamber is absolutely massive. A series of runes lead up to the sky. I don't know exactly what this looks like. The just description is a little unclear, but I'm assuming that it's ruins up the canyon wall. And friends, this wardstone, like the chamber, is massive. Violet speculates that it's far too big and heavy for even a dragon to carry, so it must have been carved into the very chamber. It has a shimmering black pillar that rises twice the height of Zayden, and we know that Zayden is six foot five, so what, approximately 13 feet or so. And its circumference is so wide that nine people with outstretched hands would barely touch one another. While we don't know for certain, Finn Ryerson did believe that this pillar is polished iron. So we're just gonna go with, yes, it is iron because hey iron flame name of the book there is a series of circles at least six feet across etched into the center of this giant iron pillar these circle symbols each fit within the next to create a rune pattern that is similar but notably not identical to what is in warwick's journal all right so that's arisha's wardstone now let's move to the big kahuna the main wardstone it's in bisgayeth which is close to the veil where the hatching grounds are meaning it is the strongest and most powerful source of magic that's why they needed the wardstone there. You access this wardstone from within Beskyth through a secret passage that goes into an underground tunnel. This wardstone and its chamber are twice as big as the one in Arisa, so it's like double the massiveness, and it acts as the source for all of the kingdom's wards, which creates something of a dome over the majority of Navarre, excluding Arisha, though. If that wardstone was activated, wards would extend far beyond what this Beskyth wardstone is capable of. The imbued hum of power in this Biscayeth Wardstone vibrates your very bones tenfold the intensity of the one in Arisha. The wards and runes carved into this stone are interrupted by a diamond pattern, which is interesting because that is different than the one in Arisha. I am so, I really hope we learn more about the differences of these two wardstones because friends, they are not the exact same here. <gasps> I wonder if the Arisha ones could actually let the Griffin Flyers wield within them. I don't know that. Sorry, I try not to speculate in the archive section, so let's go back to the facts here. When properly activated, the top of the wardstone is ever burning with black flames, aka an iron flame. Last thing here on activating and how they're built is that the wardstones are built to open up to the sky so that the dragons can have access to the chamber. Because hey, remember, the dragons are absolutely essential to activating these wardstones. How do you create and activate a wardstone? Well, until now, it was considered a lost magic. We mostly know how to activate wardstones instead of create them, but a few pieces of information we know about creating the wardstone is that runes are central to these wardstones. And after the first six placed the last rune, they placed the wardstone where the dragons felt the deepest currents of magic run. 
which is interesting because it seems like it was built within the very chamber itself, but then the first six had to move the wardstone. So, hmm, I wonder how that worked. Anyway, before the wardstone can be activated, it first has to be imbued with a whole lot of power, which is done through riders and probably flyers, though I don't think that's confirmed, channeling their power into the stone. Without enough imbued power, the wardstone can't do anything and it's just cold, empty, and it's like lifeless, you know? When it is imbued, it hums with this stored power. What a beautiful sound of protection that must be. Violet and Zayden and Dane, they spent weeks imbuing the Arishan Wardstone. However, when the Bisgaeth Wardstone needs imbued power immediately, Sloane siphons Lilith and Aimser's power, transferring everything they have, including their life energy, into the Wardstone so it would have enough power to be activated again. There are two books in existence that we know of that explain how to create and activate wards. And they're both written from members of the first six who created the original wards. One is the Journal of Warwick, who we later learned purposefully gave false information to raise the wards. He believed that it should not be duplicatable. And by it becoming a lost art, a lost magic, Navarre will always hold the upper hand with its wards already in place. However, the other journal is written by Lyra, and she shares the truth about how to activate a ward stone, the truth truth of it with seven dragons because she believes the knowledge should be shared. So instead of six plus the one combined, Lyra directly says seven who have to set the wardstone ablaze in an iron flame. So with all this knowledge, we know that one dragon from each of these seven, as Jisenya says, seven dens, has to breathe fire on the wardstone. Only one dragon can contribute its flame to a wardstone. And because the seventh dragon den seemingly disappeared, there would be no way to get the wards from the Arisha wardstone up and running. The seven dragons from the seven dens, they inhale as one and exhale fire into the chamber onto the imbued wardstone. And when properly activated, an iron flame ignites and continues to burn for all eternity until Jack fucking Barlow comes along. A pulse of magic vibrates through the riders when this is activated, signaling the wards are now in place. The reason why the Arisha wardstone partially activates is because six of the dragons breathe fire onto it. This doesn't cause the wardstone to ignite with an iron flame, but it's a hell of a lot better than nothing. And it also means that the Griffin Flyers can still wield their powers, I'm guessing because the complete dragon power doesn't properly secure its wards. The Wyvern essentially deactivate within these wards. They don't fully die, which is a decent short-term solution, as again, we saw in the stretch of chapters, but it'll fade and fail soon enough. Oh, and how do you deactivate a wardstone, you ask? Great question. We learned this from Jack fucking Barlow. God, I hate how you keep popping up. As far as we understand, when a dragon is killed slash sacrificed and bleeds onto the wardstone, the black flame extinguishes. In the case of the Biscayeth wardstone, the dragon bathes, weight causes the wardstone to fall, crash, and stops all power. In fact, it, it cleaves it in two. However, to our surprise, a mender can mend the wardstone back together so it can be imbued and reactivated. Whew, I feel like I just ran a marathon with that one. <laughs> I hope this was helpful for you all. Wardstones, they play such a central role to the story and understandably, they are a little bit confusing. So I really hope that helped. Amazing, Lux. That was so good. And as always, let us close out with taking flight with our favorite moments. I'm going to kick it off with Sawyer telling Jacinia the very, very romantic line that her turtle is blue. More Garrick in our lives. Nicole already mentioned this, but we have to mention it again because it is Garrick. Just doing my part to help your communication skills thrive in a stable relationship. To which Imogen, Jen, oh, I miss my girl Imogen, she replies he has no room to talk about stable relationships. Oh, burn. I need to know their drama. He also says that he has plenty of mares in his stable. Is Garrick a fuckboy? Are you surprised? Yes, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> and that's probably why there's some tension between him and Imogen. Oh my God, that's amazing. <laughs> and Darna arguing with Taryn and how that is all she does now. Quote, Taryn could tell her the grass is green and she'd eviscerate yet another sheep on it just to change the color. Also, Zayden and Violet silently fighting before heading off to the cave's rooms mission. And Kat says, are you two fighting silently? And Sloane says, they do that. Just imitating <laughs> Nicole here. Violet telling scribe jokes. We might not compliment each other, but we compliment each other. 
get it with an E instead of the I. This right here is why I say that she's a Ravenclaw and not ultimately a Gryffindor. You can't take the scribe out of her. This is something you would joke about. You would 100% make this joke. <laughs> I got such a kick out of this line because it was like, ha, I get it. <laughs> One of my favorite moments is every morsel of what's your second signet scene. All of chapter 56. Favorite of the book. Brennan and Violet are talking about their dad and Markham teaching Violet these old languages. And she reflects that she is Markham's biggest failure, but dad's biggest success. Brennan says in response. I also love that when he takes the book back from Violet, he says, anytime you want it, it's yours. Looks like someone learned their lesson about keeping books from Violet. Props to you, Brennan. I will give you credit where credit is due. You know, I don't love this, but I do love how relatable the feeling is that Violet is grappling with when it comes to Zayden. She says the phrase, I'm quickly learning it's possible to love someone and not want to be with them at the same time. I know I personally felt this deeply in my past love life, and I feel like a lot of us can relate to it. 100%. Violet reflecting on everyone celebrating now that the wards are up in Ryerson House and how it makes the castle, quote, feel less like a fortress and more like a home. Like your future home is what you're saying to me, Violet. (laughs) All right. That is it for today's episode 10. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, next episode, we will be covering chapters 57 through 60. We're getting to these shorter stretches of chapters because there is just so much information in every single one of them. And I'm so excited as we finish out our iron flame deep dives i'm gonna miss empyrean while we go to prithian i'm gonna miss it thank you as always to our executive producer hayden aka our sanity manager we don't know what we would do without you and if you love fantasy fangirls and want to support us the best way you can do so is joining that patreon party link in the show notes we are also going to be starting a newsletter very soon i know we've been saying that for a little bit we're doing some things behind the scenes but it is coming to you soon and if you want to get all of the updates for fantasy fangirls as well as more from members of our community like fantasy authors and small businesses please subscribe again link is in the show notes and if you are not following us on instagram and slash or tiktok what are you doing go ahead give us a follow at fantasy fangirls pod also do not forget to rate and review the show on whatever podcasting platform you are listening on it takes five seconds and it is one of the best ways to help the show also if you're watching on youtube please like and subscribe it is so helpful and speaking of helpful please share with your fellow iron flame friends you know those friends who you speculated that zayden was an intrinsic and you had like full out debates with them about if zayden's intrinsic if he's not an intrinsic send this to them and we us correct people can revel in our (laughs) glory together friends we love you thank you so much for being here with us today and we will see you next time where two sisters dive deep into beloved I stop talking. I just stop talking. <laughs> Let's try that again. House blah blah blah. She's blah blah night blah slip realizes what Nicole. What did you write here? Oh my god! <laughs> and Violet chuckling off hand chuckling off handy handily handedly. Nope, that doesn't make sense. For the floor blah 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 blah. blah. We're doing great today. Arisha's <laughs> first hatchings of Arisha's first hat of Arisha's first of Arisha's first hatchling. Whether that's Brennan. Whoa. <laughs> you are not following us on Twitter and social or Instagram. Give us T- a follow. TikTok, not Twitter. T- We're not on Twitter. We're not, we are not on TikTok. <laughs> to, uh, blah, blah, blah. 